Good evening, everyone. May I have your attention? Welcome to Hudson and the Hudson Library and Historical Society. I have a few little minor housekeeping announcements to make very briefly. If you have cell phones, please be respectful and either put them on mute or silence or turn them off so they don't go off in the middle of the program. Um, for those of you that are just coming in, we can sneak you in the back and maybe some chairs, and there's some chairs throughout the audience up here. There are two chairs up here. There are a couple up here, so come on up front, folks. Secondly, I need to remind you that the Learned Owl, our wonderful independent bookstore, is selling Mr. Brown's book this evening, both in the entryway and then later, after this program, we will have a reception for Mr. Brown in the rotunda of the library. As you know, you go out the door and sort of hang a left, um, where we'll have refreshments and you'll be able to visit with him and have him sign your books. So try and hold your signings and conversations with him toward the end, but if you have questions, we'll do questions briefly here after he speaks. Third, I want to point out the fact that in the back of the room there's a box on the wall next to the pictures of Hudson Houses where we accept donations for programming. And as you know, this gets to be an expensive venture, I would hope you know, to transport these authors across the country. Uh, Mr. Brown told me just a few minutes ago this is the first stop on his book tour, so we should feel very honored. <laughs> But if you have an inkling or a desire or would like to part with some money just for the heck of it, the library is always indeed in thing for bringing authors like Well, I'll just talk a little louder. We are exceptionally fortunate. Oh, he's handing me one over here. Oh, that's yours. We are exceptionally fortunate and honored to share with Hudson, Ohio, yet another Mr. Brown. <laughs> In case you were unaware, Hudson was once home to John Brown, the abolitionist. This Mr. Brown, however, to the best of my knowledge, has no familiar connection to our Hudson Browns. I will tell you he is from the west coast of the United States, so I feel exceptionally honored when we even sunshine for him as opposed to rain. In case you were unaware of his book, it's called Boys in the Boat, and it has gained a great deal of acclaim and notoriety and has been on the New York Times bestsellers list for many weeks. We were just discussing the fact that even Pippa Middleton has read his book and commented on it. And he has written many other books, I should not many, but several other books. And tonight he told me he's in negotiations for the film version of this book. So please, bear with me. I hope you will welcome Mr. Daniel James Brown to Hudson, Ohio. And remember questions immediately after and then into the rotunda. So without further ado, Mr. Brown. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Just so far. Okay. Um, thank you for that, that very nice introduction. This is, in fact, the first stop on um, three weeks of, of book touring. Uh, all over the country. Uh, this is for the paperback uh, edition of the book. I did a tour for the hardcover a about a year ago. And, um, you know, the first night out on that book tour, I went to Chicago and I had three people uh, in attendance. <laughs> so it's, <laughs> it's been a lot of fun to watch the reaction to the, to the book grow and, um, and see such nice crowds out who are interested in it. Um, let me start by pointing out that um, this story of these uh, nine young Americans who, um, who went to, uh, to Berlin in 1936 is, is not the, the story that first comes to mind when people think about the 36 Olympics, of course. The first thing that comes to most people's uh, mind, understandably, is uh, the Jesse Owens story. And with good reason. The Jesse Owens story is, is one of those stories that um, – 
that we tell and retell and keep alive because it helps remind us of some of the things that we value as, as a people, things like fairness and equality and level playing field and great individual achievement. I, I think the story of these nine uh, boys from the Pacific Northwest who went to that same Olympic Games um, is another story that's worth telling and retelling because I think it also uh, helps remind us of some of the things that we value. And in particular, um, this is not like the Jesse Owens story. This is not a, a story of a great individual achievement, although there were great individual achievements along the way. This is, this is really a story of a great collective team uh, achievement. And I think it helps remind us that in our history there have been times when we've been very good at, um, at creating great, great teams. And, and I'd like to come back to that theme in a little bit. But um, first, let me talk a little bit about how I came to write this book. About six years ago, uh, my, my neighbor, a lady I knew then only as Judy, came to me, uh, to my house. We, were, we, we had these horrible homeowners association meetings uh, in my neighborhood. And we get together and we argue about you know, what color you may or may not paint your mailbox. And we get in ferocious ferocious fights over these things. And uh, this particular year was at my house. So uh, after the meeting, Judy came up to me. And uh, she said that she, um, she was reading one of my earlier books um, to her father. And her father was in the last couple of his uh, months of his life living under a hospice care at her home. He was enjoying that book. And, and he wondered if I would come down and, and meet him. So, so, of course, I did. I think it was the very next day that I went down to Judy's house, and I met this elderly gentleman named Joe Lance. And Joe was very weak. He was on oxygen. Um, but we sat down, and, and we talked a little bit about that earlier book. And then um, he began to talk about his childhood experiences growing up during the Depression. And if you've read the book, you know he had a very, very challenging, uh, almost heart-rending family situation to overcome when he was growing up. And then he began to talk about how he had come to row crew at the University of Washington beginning in the fall of 1933, and how that had, um, had to begun to, to transform and, and redeem his life I in certain ways, and how ultimately he and his crewmates had wound up rowing um, in Berlin in 1936 in front of Hitler and the other top Nazis against a German boat for a, for a gold medal. And uh, I mean, as a writer, I hadn't gone down there looking for a story, but the, I was just mesmerized by this story. And um, so I asked Joe that very first day if I could write a book ab about his life. And he said, he said that uh, he didn't want me to write a book about his life, but I could write a book about the, all the boys in the boat if I wanted to. And so that's what I set out to do. And, you know, as, as Joe was talking to me that day, I noticed that quite often he, he would tear up. And, and, and I noticed that in particular he would tear up whenever he began to talk about those other boys in the, in the boat. So I knew, I knew right away that there was a lot more to this than, than just, you know, a race in Berlin back in 1936. There was a lot, a lot of heart there. And... And I tried to figure out what those tears were for. At first, I thought they were for the loss of his, comp his teammates, most of whom had passed away in the previous few years. But the more we talked, the more I came to understand that there was a, a kind of joy and pride coming through those tears, and that what he really was crying about was the sheer, the sheer beauty of what they had all become that, that summer before. 75 years before in Berlin, that, that almost perfect thing that they were when they were all together as a crew. And, and, and so that was a, an enormous revelation to me. And I've tried to keep that spirit uh, in mind as, as I wrote the book. So I went down to Judy's um, house that day expecting to hear a story about rowing, but I, I found out that it was so much more than a story about rowing. And as I went on and began to talk to the families of the other boys in the boat, I 
I quite quickly came to understand that this was, was a big, epic, sweeping story about the human heart rather than just a sports story. It was a story about this one boy named Joe who had to learn to survive by trusting only himself, but then had to learn it's almost polar opposite, that to get what he wanted out of life, to become part of this crew, he had to learn to depend on and trust others. It was a story about craftsmanship and grace and pride and the pursuit of an ideal and how those, how those values were embodied in this, in this interesting character named George Yeoman Pocock. It was a story about a very difficult man named Al Ulbrichsen, the coach uh, who was obsessed with uh, realizing an Olympic dream. It was a story about grit and determination in the face of overwhelming odds, about punishing pain, psychological devastation, and ultimate jubilation. It was a story about the American genius for defying long odds. And it was very fundamentally a story about democratic idealism come face to face with fascist cynicism. And really on that level, it was pretty starkly a story of good and evil. Now that's not to say that rowing isn't central to, to the book, and it is certainly the stage on which these other human dramas are uh, played out. You know, I get emails um, every day from readers um, uh, talking about the book. And one comment that comes up um, almost every day, I get an email, uh, somebody saying something to the effect of, I almost didn't read your book uh, because I thought it was about rowing and really what could possibly be more boring than a, <laughs> a book about rowing. And you know, I would have said the same thing six years ago. I mean, it would not be a topic I would not pick up, would not have picked up a book about, about rowing. Fortunately, most of them go on to say, wow, I was really wrong though, it turned out to be a, a lot more than that. Um, and, pe and they acknowledge that it, that it is about more than rowing. But you know, it actually does, it also turned out that rowing was much more interesting than, than I would have thought it was. Um, th there's actually, there's an extreme physical challenge in, in this sport that very few things that human beings do, I think, match for the, um, match rowing for the rapid output of energy that this sport requires. They say that playing two NBA basketball games back to back uh, is about the equivalent amount of energy to what an Olympic rower puts out in the course of a six minute 2000 meter race. So an extraordinary amount of, of uh, sheer raw energy and power required. There's very few things that match rowing for the exquisite coordination and synchronization and teamwork that are required. Somebody pointed out to me once that uh, putting eight men or women in a, in a rowing shell and, and asking them to row one of these races is like putting eight men or women in front of uh, eight golf balls and asking them to hit those balls at precisely the same moment with precisely the same amount of force, directing the ball in precisely the same direction and to do that over and over every couple of seconds, over and over and over again. It's really quite extraordinary, the, 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 the skill that is involved. There's also the incredible mental toughness uh, of rowing. It, rowing out uh, in the wind and the rain and the snow and the sleet day after day, um, the place I'm most familiar with up in Lake Washington in Seattle, it's darn cold out on that lake in January, believe me. And, and so the physical uh, and mental toughness required to keep at it is fascinating. There's a long colorful history and tradition associated with rowing that I, uh, I didn't know about when I started this project. There's the aesthetics of the sport and particularly back in the days that I'm talking about in the 30s when, uh, when these guys rowed in these beautiful cedar shells, these Western red, red cedar shells, just beautiful things in and of themselves. There's a, an extraordinary beauty to a crew rowing perfectly out on a still lake in the morning mist in a wooden shell. It's really something to behold. And there's a great deal more drama actually in a crew race than might be obvious standing on the shore and just watching the do boats go by. And I, I've got a passage I'd like to read to try to illustrate that uh, in just a moment. Um, First, though, I, 
I think it's important to understand the world in which this story took place and, and why it had the impact that it did. I, it's important to recall um, how very popular crew was in the 1920s and 1930s. In those days, 100,000 people would routinely show up for a, a rowing regatta, not just on the East Coast, but also out on the West Coast and the Midwest. Um, on a Saturday afternoon, 70, 80, 90,000 people might turn out for a major regatta. Regattas, um, important races, were broadcast sometimes live coast to coast on, uh, on the radio, which was then a new medium. Prominent oarsmen uh, would find their images on the cover of Saturday Evening Post. Uh, Coxon's sore throat could make headlines in a newspaper. So it was a, it was a big deal. And in fact, at the 1936 Berlin Olympics, the, the rowing events were the second most popular venue uh, at those games, following only the uh, track and field events in the big Olympic Stadium. So I have a passage I'd like to read to try to illustrate the kind of atmosphere and drama that surrounded these events, but I need to sort of set the scene for you. This takes place, this scene takes place in the spring of 1936 in Poughkeepsie, New York. It is the big national championship race. There are um, thousands of boats on the river full of spectators, everything from a Navy destroyer from the Naval Academy to rowboats. Uh, li lining the, the course on the Hudson River. There's a fellow named Mike Bogle up on the railroad bridge ready to detonate a series of bombs, the number of bombs corresponding to the lane assignment of the winning boat. There are thousands of people in town for the event, thousands of people along the Palisades of Poughkeepsie. To nourish their dream of going on to the Olympics that year, these nine boys from Washington, um, they need to win this race, and in particular, they need to defeat their arch rivals from Cal Berkeley. Kai Ebright, the coach at Cal, has twice before gone to the Olympics and won gold medals. He's won the two previous national championships. And the coach of these Washington boys, Al Ulbrichsen, is obsessed with going to the Olympics, beating Kai Ebright and going to the Olympics this year. Kai, uh, Ulbrichsen, I should also uh, mention, is a very dour man. He does not like to betray emotion, uh, particularly in front of sports writers and, and to the boys who row for him. The race gets off very late in the day because of tidal conditions. It's 6 p.m. and uh, dusk is beginning to settle over the river. Ulbrichsen is, and uh, the press contingent is watching the race unfold from an observation train that is running parallel to the river, keeping up with the boats. <coughs> Ulbrichsen has told his uh, coxswain, Bobby Mock, to, um, to row from behind, but under no circumstances to get more than two lengths behind. And it's a very long race. It's a four-mile race. Coming down towards the last mile, um, Bobby Mock has been holding the boat for a staggering four lengths behind the leaders to Ulbrichsen's utter consternation. He cannot figure out what Mach is doing, and he's slowly becoming more and more frantic as the race approaches the last mile or so. So let me pick it up from there. Let's see. On the train, Al Ulbrichsen had all but given up. They're too far behind, he muttered. They're overplaying their hand. We'll be lucky to finish third. Ulbrichsen's face was ashen. It seemed to have turned entirely to stone. He'd even stopped chewing his gum. In the lane nearest to him, California had powered back out in front, rowing beautifully. With a tiring field behind them and less than a mile to go, Cal was in a commanding position to win. Kai Bright, it seemed, had somehow outwitted him again. But if anybody had outwitted Al Ulbrichsen, it was his own coxswain, the short kid with his own Phi Beta Kappa T, and now he would show his hand. Suddenly, he leaned into Don Hume's face and bellowed, give me 10 hard ones for Ulbrichsen. 10 long spruce oars bowed in the water 10 times. Then Mock bellowed again, give me 10 more for Pocock. Another 10 enormous strokes, then a lie. Here's California, we're on them. 10 more big ones for mom and dad. Very slowly, the Husky Clipper slipped past Columbia 
and began to creep up on Navy in second. Someone on the train idly remarked, well, Washington's picking up. And a minute later, someone else called out much more urgently, look at Washington, look at Washington, here comes Washington. On the train and on shore, all eyes shifted from the leaders to the eight white blades barely visible out in the middle of the river. Another deep guttural roar began to rise from the crowd. It seemed impossible for Washington to close the gap. They were half a mile from the finish now, still in third place, still two lengths back, but they were moving, and the way they were moving compelled immediate and absolute attention. In the boat, Mach was incandescent. Okay, now, 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 he barked. Don Hume took the stroke up to 35, then to 36, then to 37. On the starboard side, Joe Rance fell in behind him just as smooth as silk, and the boat began to swing. The bow began to rise out of the water. Washington slid past the middies as if the Navy boat were pinned to the water. Cal's coxswain, Grover Clark, glanced across the river, and for the first time since he left it behind at the starting line, he saw the Washington boat sweeping up on his stern. Stunned, he bellowed at his crew to pick it up, and Cal's rate climbed quickly to 38. Mock hollered at Hume to take it up another notch, and Washington went to 40. The rhythm of the California boat seemed to waver and then grow erratic. California and Washington careened into the last 500 yards, storming down the corridor of open water between the spectators' boats. People in rowboats were standing up now, risking a dunking to see what was happening. Some of the large excursion steamers began to list toward the center of the river as people crowded their rails. The roar of the crowd began to engulf the oarsmen. Boat whistles shrieked. On the float in front of Washington's shell house, Evanda May Calamar, the crew's cook, waved a frying pan over her head, whooping and urging the boys on. In Washington's press car, pandemonium broke out. George Barnell of the Seattle Times shoved his press credentials into his mouth and began to devour them. <laughs> Tom Bowles commenced beating a stranger on the back with his lucky old fedora. Royal Brougham was shouting, come on, Washington, come on. Only Al Ulbrichson remained motionless and silent, still riveted to his seat, his eyes cold gray stones locked on the white blades out in the river. Joe Williams of the World Telegram stole a glance at him and thought, this guy has ice water in his veins. With the finish line looming ahead of him in the gathering dark, Bobby Mock screamed something inarticulate. Johnny White in the number three seat suddenly had the sensation that they were flying now, not rowing. Stubb McMillan desperately wanted to peek, to glance over toward lane one, where he knew California would be, but he didn't dare. In number six, over the crowd noise, Shorty Hunt could hear someone on a radio yelling frantically. He tried to make out the words, but all he could tell was that something terribly exciting was happening. He had no idea how things stood, except that he still hadn't seen the California boat fall into his field of view. He kept his eyes locked on the back of Joe Rance's neck and pulled with his whole heart. Joe had boiled everything down to one action, one continuous movement, one thought, the crew's old mantra running on through his mind like a river, hearing it over and over, not in his own voice, but in George Pocock's crisp Oxford accent, mind in boat, mind in boat, mind in boat. Then in the last 200 yards, thinking itself fell away and pain suddenly came shrieking back into the boat, descending on all of them at once, searing their legs, their arms, their shoulders, clawing at their backs, tearing at their hearts and lungs as they desperately gulped at the air. And in those last 200 yards, in an extraordinary burst of speed, rowing at 40 strokes per minute, Washington passed California. With each stroke, the boys took their rivals down by the length of another seat. By the time the two boats crossed the line in the last vestiges of twilight, a glimmer of open water showed between the stern of the Husky Clipper and the bow of the California Clipper. In the press car, the corners of Al Ulbrichson's mouth twitched reluctantly into something vaguely resembling a smile. He resumed chewing his gum, slowly and methodically. Standing next to him, George Pocock threw back his head and howled like a banshee. Tom Bowles continued to flog the back of the fellow in front of him with his old fedora. George Farnell removed the well-masticated remains of his press credentials from his mouth. In Seattle, Hazel Ulbrichson and her son Al Jr. pounded the glass top of their coffee table until it shattered into dozens of pieces. Up on the automobile bridge, Mike Bogo had the distinct pleasure of setting off seven bombs in rapid succession. And in the boat, 
the boys pumped their fists in the dark night air. For a long while, Ulbrichsen just sat there, staring into darkness as fans came rushing through the car congratulating him and slapping him on the back. When he finally stood up, reporters crowded around him and he said simply, well, they made it close, but they won. And then he elaborated, I guess that little runt knew what he was doing. And so from there, they went on to uh, the uh, Olympic trials in Princeton, where they quite handily beat uh, California and everybody else and won the right to go on um, to, um, to Berlin. And um, actually, just as a little sort of side note, about two hours after they won uh, the right to go to Berlin as Team USA, Henry Penn Burke from the Pennsylvania Athletic Club uh, came to them. And he said, well, congratulations on winning. And I hope you know that you're gonna, you boys are going to have to pay their own way to Berlin. A a and nobody had ever told the Washington uh, contingent that they would have to pay their own way. And none of these boys had two nickels to rub together. So, uh, and, and Burke went on to say, uh, well, Pennsylvania came in second, and they've got the money, so they'll be happy to go in your place. So it's not a problem. <laughs> so that night, I mean, within minutes, phones started to ring back in Seattle. And they rang all night long, basically. And by morning, there were um, organizing committees had been formed. And there were hundreds of both students and just Seattle citizens out on the street corners uh, all over Seattle selling little paper badges for 50 cents apiece. And, um, and other people were making phone calls to institutions in Seattle, like the Seattle Times. And, and contributions started to, to pour in. And within 48 hours, they raised the $5,000 they needed and wired it back to New York. And, and the guys were good to go, um, but only because the, the citizens of Seattle uh, insisted that it, that it was going to happen. And the story culminates, of course, in this extraordinary uh, gold race, gold medal race in Berlin. And um, um, you, know, you, you know from the minute you pick the book up that we win this that we win this race. That's not really at issue. So if you didn't know already, I'll tell you right now. They win this gold medal race. Um, but it was, it, it's really how they won it that was quite extraordinary. And, and you need to understand the context. There was so much going against them that day. It was a windy, uh, miserable day. Uh, Germany, although the US team, the boys from Washington, and the British team had turned in the two fastest qualifying times they were inexplicably assigned lanes five and six out in the widest part of the court where the uh, course where they would have to row into a very stiff headwind. Germany and Italy, the two fascist powers, had turned in relatively slow starting times, but they were assigned lanes one and two, which were sheltered the entire length of the race course. The, um, the Germans had won the first five rowing events of the day leading up to the eight oared race, which is the prestige event. But they had won gold medals fi in five consecutive events. And the mostly German crowd was in a frenzy, chanting Deutschland, Deutschland, Deutschland. Hitler and Goebbels and Goering and all the top Nazis were arrayed on a balcony looking out over the race course. And there's some very uh, interesting old grainy footage of them slapping each other on the back and jumping up and down as, as Germany wins this series of gold medals. Um, and then on top of everything else, Don Hume, the, the stroke or the guy in the boat who sets the rhythm for the boat, had been sick with a fever for, well, for weeks on and off. And in the couple days leading up to the gold medal race, had been in bed with a high fever. And um, the coach, Coach Ulbrichsen, tried to put a substitute in for him, but the boat just wouldn't go right. And so the night before the gold medal race, the other boys came to Ulbrichsen, and very uncharacteristically, because Ulbrichsen wasn't a man people challenged, the boys came to him and they said, Don Hume's got to be in the boat. He just has to be there. Tie him in. We'll hold him up, but he's got he's to be in the boat. And at the last minute, Ulbrichsen relented and put Don Hume in the boat even as sick as he was. But for the first half of the race especially, he was, he was, he was al almost unconscious. I mean, it's hard to overstate how, how sick he was. And then on top of all that, um, at the start 
the, the American boys, because they were out in the windy part of the course, they didn't hear the, the, the start was just shouted in French. And it may have been partly that it was in French. <laughs> so, but they didn't either didn't hear or didn't understand the start, didn't know that the race had started until they saw the boats off to, their, uh, to, to one side lurch forward. So they got off to a terrible start. They came storming down out into the middle of the longer sea. And at 1,000 meters halfway through the course, they were dead last, and uh, the Italians and the German boats were running away with it on those uh, inside sheltered lanes. And you have to read the book in order not to find out how, who wins, but how they win. Uh, you have to read the book, because it's really quite glorious. Um, now, as I say, I get emails uh, every day from, from, from readers all over the country and actually all over the world now about the book. Um, and there's a couple comments uh, that, that come up from American readers all the time and that are kind of interesting. One is that from people from both sides of our political spectrum, often quite far to both sides of our political spectrum, uh, are always emailing me telling me that if the other side would just read this book, Everything would just be marvelous in this country. And, and I find that really interesting. And the other thing that comes up all the time is I get emails, I get emails particularly from men of a certain age telling me that as they finish the book, they have tears in their eyes. Um, and, and so I've been trying to understand um, those two reactions and, and figure out what they have in common and what they might mean. Um, trying to understand them. And I think what it boils down to is that a lot of people see in this story um, things that we lost somewhere along the way. And I think there's a hankering for, for things that are long gone. And I think a big part of that is simply remembering a time when we were better able to, um, to work together, to build teams, uh, and to get along. So with, with that in mind, I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes as I move towards the conclusion here. I, uh, I want to reflect on a, a few of the things, the qualities that I think made this team extraordinary. And some of them obvious and some of them less obvious, probably. Uh, what, it was that what, m what it was that went into making them that almost perfect thing that Joe Rance cried about in the last couple months of his life. First of all, I think is their extraordinary, and this is one of the obvious things about them, their extraordinary perseverance. If you look at the improbable stock from which this crew was put together, you can't help but be impressed by their tenacity and their toughness, both mental and physical. These were, these were boys who grew up in mill towns and logging camps and fishing towns around western Washington. These, are, well, these were kids who grew strong wielding axes and, and pitchforks. Um, and yet to get where they wanted to go together as a team, they had to take on and defeat boys from the Ivy League schools in the East, boys who were in many cases were very privileged, boys who had learned to row in prep schools. When these guys at Washington showed up, they didn't know one end of an oar from the other. They had to row against kids who had learned to row in prep school, kids who were in many cases, <coughs> excuse me, the sons of um, very well-heeled people, often sometimes U.S. senators. Uh, President Roosevelt had a couple of sons rowing at this time. So in the East, rowing was still somewhat a class, uh, privileged class sort of activity. And, and those, were, those were the kinds of boys that these uh, boys from Washington State had to row against. Um, and then beyond that, when they got to the preliminaries in Berlin, they had to row against kids who in some cases were literally aristocrats, kids from Oxford and Cambridge in the UK. Uh, and then ultimately they had to take on and row against uh, this hand-picked Nazi crew. So they were perpetual underdogs in that sense and they were constantly persevering and going through the next barrier and taking it to the next level of competition. So that's one thing, their perseverance I think was extraordinary. A second less obvious thing is that they had a higher cause, and, and this is hard to understand without um, talking a little bit about a man named George Pocock. Just very briefly, if you haven't read the book, George Pocock was a British-born um, boat builder who handcrafted these beautiful cedar shells 
that, that they rode in in those days. And he was an exquisite craftsman, and he was an idealist. He believed in doing things uh, as close to ideally as possible. He was also a very good rower, and um, he, both in building boats and in teaching about rowing, he tried to teach these young men to reach for the ideal, to reach for something higher, to, to race to win, certainly, but to row and to race to make better men of themselves. There was a kind of spiritual quality to Pocock about endeavoring to be your best at something, in this case, rowing. And it permeated the culture of this, of this crew, of these coaches, and of this story. Um, Every chapter in the book uh, starts with a, a quote from Pocock o along those lines. I'll just read one of them. He said, um, if the great art is rowing, it's the finest art there is. It's a symphony of motion. And when you are rowing well, why, it's nearing perfection. And when you near perfection, you're touching the divine. So they had a sense of purpose, of, higher, of a higher purpose. The third thing about them is that they weren't an accidental team. They were put together. They were designed as a team. Rowing is a sport that um, you would think that you could just put the nine strongest men or women in a boat, and that boat would beat the boat next to it. But rowing coaches have told me over and over that it's, it's not that simple. Rowing crews are put together by very careful mixtures of both physical types and personality types. It takes, uh, for instance, strong, heavy men in the middle of the boat, lighter, more technically proficient men. I'm talking about men in this case. Same thing applies in women's boats up front uh, of the boat. It takes people of a certain kind of character to calm a crew down and keep them on keel. It takes somebody else with a different kind of temperament to act as a sort of spark plug for the crew. So like most great rowing crews, this one was carefully designed, and it took a lot of mixing and matching to get that blend just right. And it really wasn't actually till they dropped, till Ulrichsen dropped Joe Rance into the number seven seat in the spring of 1936 that that boat finally really took off. So it was carefully designed. It was thoughtfully put together. The fourth thing that I think was critical was, and hard to overstate, was the enormous amount of trust and mutual respect that these nine young men had for one another. Trust is absolutely essential in rowing, uh, more than in, in most endeavors, uh, more than any kind of endeavor actually I can think of off, offhand. To get in a boat and to row with that perfect synchronicity and execute that perfectly, you have to become part of something larger than yourself. You have to become part of this organism, this single thing that the boat is. And that requires an enormous amount of mutual trust. And these, these boys had that, had that uh, uh, to a degree that's hard to overstate. In fact, of all the crews that Pocock saw, came, excuse me, Pocock saw come and go over the years, um, he singled out this crew as the one that best exemplified mutual trust. And by the way, these guys, they trusted each other and they cared for each other on such a deep level. It's hard to overstate. When I knew the survivors of them as old men, it was so deeply touching the way they cared for each other and cared about each other and kept in constant contact 75 years after, after this event had happened. It was just remarkable to behold. And then the final thing that I would point out or I would say as a hallmark of this crew and perhaps good teams, great teams in general, was this, and it may be the least obvious thing. These were strong young men, and they were tough young men, and each of them had a, a good deal of ego. Rowing's a tough thing to go out for unless you're pretty confident in yourself. But each of them also had a measure of humility, and I think that that was an enormous part of their success. The harsh demands of rowing, because rowing really is harsh, um, taught them humility. The pain and the suffering of it taught them uh, humility. And, and I think that humility was the gateway through which they were able to open their hearts to one another and approach one another and build that trust that was, that was so important. And 
And that becomes really important to the story. When I stand back from this story, and I didn't think in these terms until I was done with the book, uh, after I was done with the book, when I, th when I think about the story of these nine young men who climbed in a boat and, and trusted one another and did this extraordinary thing, um, to me they are an almost perfect metaphor for what that whole generation of Americans did, the generation for most of us were our parents, um, our uncles and aunts, uh, the, what Tom Brokaw calls the greatest generation. That generation, they all suffered privation at the hands of the Depression. They all learned a measure of humility. And I think that that was what allowed them to build the great teams that they did, the teams that built things like the Grand Coulee Dam and survived the Depression and won World War II on two fronts. I mean, extraordinarily um, generous and civil uh, people and people with a sense of humility. So I want to close by just reading a couple paragraphs. Uh, near the end of the process of writing this book, I was able to go to Berlin, or actually to Grunau, the little uh, town outside of Berlin where the race course was located and is still located. And um, while I was there, I was able to go up on a balcony, and um, uh, the balcony where Hitler had stood and watched the races. And I. I just want to read about the thoughts that were going through my mind as I was there. I stood there for a long, quiet minute near where Hitler stood 75 years before, gazing out over the longer sea, seeing it much as he saw it. Down below me, young men were unloading a shell from a truck, singing something softly in German and preparing for an evening row. Out on the water, a single sculler his blades glinting, worked his way down one of the lanes towards the large Yale sign at the end of the course. Closer to me, swallows flew low over the water on silent wings, silhouetted against the declining sun, touching the water from time to time, dimpling the silver surface. Standing there, watching them, it occurred to me that when Hitler watched Joe and the boys fight their way from the rear of the field to sweep ahead of Italy and Germany 75 years ago. He saw, but did not recognize, heralds of his doom. He could not have known that one day hundreds of thousands of boys just like them, boys who shared their essential natures, decent and unassuming, not privileged or favored by anything in particular, just loyal, committed, and perseverant, would return to Germany, dressed in olive drab, hunting him down. They are almost all gone now, the legions of young men who saved the world in the years just before I was born. But that afternoon, standing on the balcony of House Vest, I was swept with gratitude for their goodness and their grace, their humility and their honor, their simple civility, and all the things they taught us before they flitted across the evening water and finally vanished into the night. Thank you all for coming. Please remember we'll hold a reception afterwards where there will be a book signing and perhaps you can visit with the author a bit in the rotunda immediately after this. Also, on the way out of the room, you'll see on the little benches off to the side, I put wonderful brochures that we've accumulated about our upcoming programs. And I can tell you it's going to be an exciting summer and fall in Hudson, Ohio, just by the caliber of our speakers. And again, please join me in thanking him. And I'm a walker and we'll take very brief questions. Okay, so if you have a question. I, uh, first of all, we did, I did have a chance to enroll with Pocox. Oh, you uh, did? As a freshman just back in 75. But um, my question is this, is the descriptions of the rowing, especially when the swing is perfect, are, are so timeless. Did those come from those who were in that boat? Because any, any oarsman would describe that today. Uh, should they have the opportunity to actually <laughs> yeah. get all, all eight swinging together like that? Yeah, a lot of those descriptions uh, did come from uh, directly from um, 
a couple of these guys left diaries and wrote also wrote letters about their experiences. And some of the, the essence of those descriptions of the swing come from, from those firsthand accounts. If you uh, have a hero in your book, over here, please. Oh, there if you, you have a hero in your book, it really is Don Mock, the uh, coxswain. But uh, the question for you, were they not offering uh, sports scholarships in those days? Those fellows worked so hard for their tuition and so forth. Yeah, that's correct. There were no, well, I don't know about other uh, athletic programs, but there were no athletic scholarships for rowing, at least at the University of Washington at all. So what they did offer was as long as you stayed on crew, you were they would give you a part-time job someplace on campus. And so for, for most of these guys, that was the difference between staying in university or, or not being able to stay there. And so they were highly motivated to, to make crew and to stay on the crew for all kinds of reasons, but one of them was simply that was the, the ticket to staying at the university. The uh, quotes that you have from Prokop at the start of each um, chapter, are those from a book that he wrote or a diary or, or where did you compile those? Uh, there, there were several books. There was a book that Prokop himself wrote. There's a book that his son Stan wrote. Uh, Stan also gave me access uh, to his father's papers and some of them are from there. One of them actually is from a note that he wrapped around an oar and sent off with one of the Washington crews to, I forget what, I think one of the Olympics, subsequent Olympics, a sort of inspirational note he wrapped around an oar and shipped off uh, to the crew at the venue. So they were from a wide variety of sources. Okay, so, um, so as you, well, I know you have a lot of uh, rowing by the time you finish the book and stuff, but, um, I'm a rower and a coxswain too. So, uh, oh, and like tried <laughs> rowing. Have I? I've set foot in a boat. Does that count? <laughs> <laughs> I I've, I can't say that I've really rowed in any meaningful sense. No, um, and it was a real concern for me. The day after I met Joe and I really wanted to write this book, one of the first things that occurred to me is how are you going to write a book about a sport you don't you don't do. And I was um, very fortunate in that, um, for one thing, the, the crew folks at the, the current crew folks at the University of Washington also got very excited when they heard I was going to do this because this is part of the lore of their, of their history. And so they came to me and, and they taught me a great deal. They did take me out in the, in the launch uh, with the freshmen many, many times. And, and they, uh, various both men and women from the program, both coaches and rowers, uh, spent a lot of time with me teaching me about technique and, and also just talking a lot about the experience of rowing under different conditions and things like that. And then I also uh, had uh, a lot of rowers read the manuscript. So it was a big, long four-year education process for me to try to get to the point where I was comfortable that I knew what I was talking about on in terms of the rowing stuff. Which begs the question, how many of you in the room have actually crewed or rowed? Wow. <laughs> and one of the things that's been interesting to me and surprising to me going around the country, I had, when I started this project, I had no idea how many people row and how many people of all different ages row. It's been really a revelation to me. Um, and, um, at, uh, and just a, an enormous pleasure to me to find so many people enjoy it. Okay, we can get one more. And see okay. On the physical part of the book, uh, my granddaughter attends the Air Force Academy. She was an all-state rower in Florida. And because of rowing, she's ranked 11th physically out of 1,400 in her class. And she's only 5'2". Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but she's ranked 11th. She, she's 5'2", she's and she's a rower and not a coxswain? Really? That's great. Again, thank you for coming. I hope you'll all take a moment and pick up some brochures on the way out about our forthcoming history brochures. Please come to our future programs. Please come and enjoy the reception. We're going to have some refreshments, and here we'll do a book signing where the Learned Owl will provide books. If you'll meet me in the rotunda, we'll go there.
give into the rotunda. Pittsburgh last June when the hardcover came. I don't think I'm going to Pittsburgh on this day. I, I sent this book to a Pittsburgh rower. A lot of rowers in Pittsburgh. So I